us pray. Holy Spirit, we know you are already among us. We ask now that you would open our minds to what it is you would say to us through these words from thousands of years ago. Open our hearts that we may be moved to act on what we hear. For we would be your faithful people now in our time. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who have been subjected to my chapel preaching before will know that I usually focus on the Hebrew Bible reading in the next Sunday's lectionary. And when I looked at next Sunday's lectionary and the Hebrew Bible reading, I almost turned and ran. <laughs> the reading from the Hebrew Bible for next Sunday is one of the great cliches in progressive Christianity. For many, Micah 6.8 has become a kind of mantra that marks us as right-thinking people, and it's now become such a cliché that we're protected from it. It's lost its power to convict us. And my first thought was, what can I do with this? And so I was going to skip it, but as you see, I decided not to do that. Maybe there's something, some power here still to convict us. In these eight verses, God orders the prophet to convene a court session because God is suing God's people. God alleges that after a long series of events in which God saved Israel and made it a thriving nation, that nation has lost patience and left God. God's accusation is short of specifics about what Israel has done that constitutes abandonment. But as you'll see, we can infer what that was from the way the dialogue unfolds. Surprisingly, the people's response does not contest the allegations. They don't say, oh, how have we abandoned you? How have we left you? They immediately ask only what they need to bring to make things right. That's because these are pious people conscious of their own sin. Even if they can't identify exactly what it is, they assume they've offended God in some way. And they're prepared to make amends. They're faithful people who want their relationship with God to continue. So they're ready to fix it. The voice representing the people asks about offerings. Year-old calves. A thousand rams. Just wrap your head around that number for a minute. Rivers, rivers of olive oil. Even their firstborn child. The extravagance of these suggestions tells us several things about the speaker. First, they're tremendously wealthy. The volume of animals and oil named are offerings that only the wealthiest in Israel could make. Second, that the voice suggests such extraordinarily large extra mile offerings tells us that they're already doing everything that's required in the way of worship, praise, and offerings. They've been working hard to maintain their relation with God. They are at the sanctuary on every required occasion and probably every optional one, too. You should be thinking of the faithful attenders in your congregation combined with your most generous givers. The folks who show up for every extra event, who will make generous extra mile gifts to get the church out of a budgetary hole, or to meet a special need, or to jumpstart the capital campaign. These are the kind of people God is suing. 
the prophet, acting as a kind of bailiff in this courtroom, declares that all this pious behavior is not what God wants. To engage in all this direct attention to God and one's relation with God, to bring God all this praise and sacrificial wealth, to spend one's time and energy in direct worship of God as though God somehow needed a constant flow of adulation and gifts to be kept happy. All of that, paradoxically, is to abandon God. This is the behavior that causes God to sue Israel. Now, because we tend to read Scripture with ourselves in the role of the righteous, and we maybe especially read this one with ourselves in the role of the righteous, we may not see how much we actually share the perspective of the voice that represents the people and offers all these things. Can we honestly say that we do not think that the main thing that God wants of us is our worship and praise and offerings? Can we honestly say that we do not teach that spirituality to those we lead? Check your language the next time you talk about worship and why we worship and see where it ends up. human acts that do not abandon God, but keep relation with God, if it's not organized religious worship? Verse 8 famously supplies the answer, and we can see how much of a challenge it was for the people in Micah's day that God dragged into court. They have not acted justly, else they would not have such an extraordinary surplus that they could think of such extravagant offerings. In that economy, that degree of wealth could come only at the expense of the basic well-being of many. And they had not committed themselves loyally, else they would never imagine offering their child. And if that's a male voice, they would never imagine that somebody's womb was their possession to talk about my womb. Nor have they walked attentively with God, else they would never have imagined that God wanted the same kind of adulation that needy human egos crave. But also, this answer to the question of what God requires is not what we have come to think it is because of problems with this translation, and there may be more of a challenge buried here than we realize. Translations commonly read that God seeks that we do justice, love kindness, or mercy, depending on the translation, and walk humbly with our God. In ordinary English, these words mean that among the many things we do, we should include acts of what we might call justice work. We should have good feelings about or think well of the quality of kindness or mercy and maybe once in a while actually practice it. <laughs> Finally, we should humble ourselves before God. I think it's the way a lot of people understand verse 8. But that last point about humbling ourselves before God depends on what we now know as a mistranslation. And the first two depend on translations that are less likely to be the meaning of the Hebrew than the translation that Seal read for us. So sorry, there will be a brief grammar lesson. <laughs> Hebrew has very few actual adverbs, words like justly and loyally, things that end in L-Y in English. To make up for that black, it often uses nouns in that role. So without extending the lesson in Hebrew grammar, let me just say that the more probable rendering of the Hebrew in Micah 6.8 is that the nouns mishpat and chesed 
justice and loyalty, are not functioning as nouns serving as the direct objects of the verb. Do this, love this, but rather as adverbs, as I translated them. Thus, instead of doing justice now and again, we are to act justly every time we act. No matter how great or small the act, no matter how ordinary or extraordinary, no matter whether the act is justice work, or the act of buying groceries, or fertilizing a lawn, or ordering from a menu, or whatever. Remember, too, that the Hebrew word mishpat, which we translate as justice, does not mean fairness, but rather that order of life that makes every creature shalom whole, well, prosperous, healthy, at peace. Thus, to act justly is in every act to act in such a way that this order of life together is built up, even if only a little bit. This is at once challenging, because it's much more all-embracing and requires much more self-awareness and self-criticism than merely adding some social change and eco-justice activities to our calendar, as important as that may be. On the other hand, it's empowering because this is something we can do every day of our lives, our whole life long. The translations love kindness and love mercy, rather than commit yourselves loyally, are similarly unhelpful, but they have an added problem. When we translate Hebrew ahav with English love, that's correct, literally. But the translation doesn't convey the right meaning. In the Hebrew Bible, the word love, ahav, is not about warm interpersonal feelings between people or a strong positive attraction to someone else or something. Instead, it comes out of treaty contexts, where it is the word used for the loyal commitment of one treaty partner to the other. Similarly, the word mistranslated as kindness or mercy, chesed, really means something like loving loyalty. It's the love that will not let us go, with the real stress on the will not let us go. So it, too, emphasizes committed and loyal relationships. So commit yourselves loyalty is, loyally is not about thinking that kindness and mercy are good things and occasionally showing them. Instead, it's about not distancing ourselves from people to whom we're corrected, connected, not reading people out of the human race, not <coughs> making people strangers who are kin before God. Whereas the focus of mishpat, justice, is on structures and systems, the focus of ahav and chesed is on relationships. To act justly is to act so that all are made whole. To commit loyally is to never treat another as an other. To recognize that all humans, as children of God, are indissolubly related to each other and therefore to us and our well-being is bound up with each other, and thus we must be committed loyally to each other and each other's well-being. Those commitments can't be nominal. They can't be mere words. They can't be saying, I'm committed to you. They have to be loyal and real. They have to involve actually committing something. Finally, we are to walk attentively with God. The Hebrew word I've translated attentively, and that traditionally has been translated humbly, is actually pretty rare in the Hebrew Bible. So in the 17th century, the translators of the King James Bible did not have enough evidence to know what it meant. Since they lived in a world of kings, and they saw God as the supreme king, 
they filled in the blank with what they thought was the proper virtue for a subject to display with a monarch, namely humility. Since the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and with more work with ancient translations, we now know that that translation, no matter how embedded in the tradition of our English translations, is wrong. The Hebrew word means attentively, scrupulously. You know, to walk humbly with God doesn't seem much of a challenge anymore. It's rote language. Of course, it's God. Everyone walks humbly with God. But to walk attentively, now there's a challenge. <coughs> to travel life's journey always watching for where God is to be found in everyday life. Watching for the thing God is doing now. Watching for what God is up to that we need to join. This is at once harder than walking humbly and empowering. For by doing it, we discover that God is always ahead of us, beside us, behind us, above us, below us, showing us what just action is, showing us what loyal commitment is. To return to the beginning, and for all of you who have been wondering if, I, if, if Micah and I just threw worship out, this is the purpose of worship for Micah not to appease the divine ego, but to tune our eyes and ears, our eyes and ears, and our hearts and minds to be more attentive to God who is walking with us in the world so that our every act may contribute its might, its brick in the edifice of a more just world. And so we may commit ourselves loyally to our fellow humans so that one day all are whole. Thanks be to